9.30. It's okay, it's 9.30. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <coughs> I have this on mute when they come in. Okay, friend, we want to start our service now. Uh, Sister Briscoe, if you could put it on me. I see you, but I don't see myself. We can see you, Pastor. Oh, okay. Well, good morning, everyone. This is our first uh, virtual worship activity of New England Baptist Church. I'd like to start with a couple of announcements since we've not had an opportunity really to gather for some time. Uh, first of all, thanks to the social media team, which is Sister Briscoe, uh, Sister Gibson, Matthew Fultz, Jeremy Fultz, Sister Jefferson, Sister Brown. The media team is there to help us unify our message across all our messaging components, whether that's the sign out front, or it's our Facebook account, or whether it's our church website, or even our bulletin. And so the technology part portion of that has gone really well. Uh, in our first weekly meeting, we use something called free conference call, and that was not uh, going to be adequate for us because the name free indicated that everybody in the country was trying to use it. And so we asked the social media team to take a look at how do we do this best, and they came back with a recommendation for Zoom. And that will be our platform going forward. So the announcements on how to access Zoom have been sent in an email. Uh, they're also on our web page. You'll have lots of opportunities to do it. And this will be a tool that we can use in a lot of different ways. We want to make you aware that uh, as we are trying to unify our message, we are monitoring all our social media accounts. Uh, for example, we have a Facebook users group. And you're invited to, uh, you can invite other people on there. One of the things I noticed this week is uh, someone who was an invited guest decided to post a video from someone else. That's taken down. It's our New Elam Baptist Church users group. We don't want videos from other people, from other churches. That's fine. If you want to listen to them, go to their site, put them on your Facebook page, but don't post them to our New Elam Baptist Church Facebook group because we're going to take it down just for clarification. And so this Zoom platform is going to give us plenty of opportunities uh, to, to meet in a lot of different ways. And so we thank God for the opportunity to, to use that. Uh, I'd like to start with a, um, kind of an update on those we know who are sick in the congregation. Uh, Sister Penny Crump had a successful operation this week. Uh, Sister Shannon Arnett had one last week. They're both recovering well. Uh, Brother Russell Abrams was in the hospital as a result of an accident. And, my heart was lifted when he walked into the church last week, and he's home and doing well. And Sister Sandra Jefferson, the, the sister of uh, Brother Jefferson, our deacon, uh, was on her way to North Carolina, and God turned the car around and said a liver was available, and she's had a successful liver transplant. So we thank God for delivering and for all the ways that uh, he has uh, manifested healing in our congregation. Uh, we want to give thanks to those in the congregation who are doing benevolence. Um, the scholarship team has made contact with our youth to make sure they're connected. We want to make sure that continues. Um, the uh, family, the adoption family has done some gifting to some of our elders. And this is one of the ways we want to stay connected. And we encourage that kind of thing. And then Friday, we had a, a call from the Cumberland Hospital, our neighbors down the street, who said that they have a need for some supplies. And so this meeting today is a result of uh, our choosing Zoom and with the free application and they assigned this time. After that, uh, one of our members graciously decided to pay for our subscription. So we have the opportunity to do a meeting at, at different times if we choose. But uh, since we had the 930 opportunity, we said, well, let's meet at 11, not really meet. But we'll do a drive-through. If you want to come by and bring your donations to the church, we'd like to see you. 
If you have cleaning supplies that we can take to Cumberland Hospital, we'd like to collect those. If you have food, if we continue our food ministry, we want to do that as well. But the most important thing, uh, well, there's a lot of important things, but one of the critical components of this is getting your feedback. How does this work? Did you have trouble using it? How can we make it easier? The first attempt that we're going to get better. And so we thank God for, uh, again, for the social media team for helping us put this together. And as we begin our worship together, I want to ask uh, Deacon Wright if he will give us an invocation and a blessing as we start our time of worship together. Uh, yes, I'll be reading. I'll be reading from Psalms 24. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Cool. Okay, good. And I'll be starting at the first verse, and I'll be reading all the way down to the tenth verse. And it reads, "The earth is the Lord in all its fullness." the world and those who dwell therein. For he has found it upon the seas and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord or who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol, nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessings from the Lord and the righteousness from the, the God of his salvation. This is Jacob, the generation of those who speak him, who seek your face. Lift up your heads, O ye gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? the Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O ye gate, lift up your everlasting doors, and the King of glory shall come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts, he is the King of glory. Amen. May the Lord have a blessing upon those who have heard the word. And let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for this opportunity we thank you, Father, for allowing us, New Zealand Baptist members, Father, to congregate in ways that we probably never thought of before. So we ask, Father, that you will bless us who are here this morning, Father, but also a blessing upon our land, upon all of our families and friends, Father. For we know that these are times that you knew about way before we were set here on earth. And we Amen. pray, God, that you would give us courage, you would give us strength. And Father, we pray, Father, that the fearful today will no longer be afraid where you have not given us a spirit of fear, but you've given us courage and you allow us to keep our eyes on you. Yes. Father, we pray that this will be an opportunity that we can worship you not only in spirit, but in truth of your word. And we will be so ever glad to give you all the praise and all the glory. And as we ask you through this son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, amen. Amen, thank you. You're welcome. One of the things that holds us together and is consistent with our theme for today, which is uh, coming from the Gospel of John, where Jesus proclaims that he is divine, is a song, Hold to God's Unchanging Hands. And so we're going to listen to a couple of verses of that now. While you're singing, it'll help you sing if you put your hands together. Yes, it is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you, Sister Briscoe, for making that work for us. And this is the thing that we ought to remember in these times. Fear tries to overtake us. That the thing we need to hold on to is God's unchanging hands. We mentioned earlier that we're going to have an hour of giving today at 11, a drive-through uh, giving opportunity. But there are some other opportunities for giving. You can go to our website, uh, newelam.org, and there's an online giving button that has been brought out. It's been made more prominent. You can mail your tithes and offering to Post Office Box 181 in New Kent. Or feel free to call the pastor and come and make arrangements for this. But we want to ask Deacon Jefferson now if he will uh, lift a prayer of thanks God to God for the offering which we will receive and also to lift up the sick and other concerns we have among us. Deacon Jefferson. Let us prepare our hearts and minds as we go to the throne of prayer. Most heavenly and all wise God, we just want to thank you first for allowing us to gather together under your umbrella of grace and mercy. We just thank you, Father, for all your continued blessings. First, Father, there are many blessings that you continue to sow. But Father, there's not enough thank you in our voices to give you the honor and praise. We want to lift up and just bless those, Father, that are bringing their offerings and tithes to the storehouse. Father, bless those offerings. Continue to use it for the upkeep of that temple. Bless each and every heart that wanted to give but did not have the means. But Father, continue to look in their hearts and bless their hearts. For you know, Father, they are your children. We look at our sick list, Father, and know that you are in control of all things. Father, you know who needs special prayer. You also know who's all anxious, Father. You also know who the needs of each and every family member is. We just want to thank you, Father, because you continue to bless each and all of us as we go through this trying period. We know, Father, that if we just continue to just Hold on to your hand, to your unchanging hand, Father, that you would just work everything out. For all of those, Father, that are struggling and going through and wondering if we are going to make it another day, we don't have to worry because you say you're in charge of all things. So regardless of who's on our sick list, regardless of who's all going through a lot of panic and stress, Father, all they have to do is look up not down, because you have everything well taken care of, Father. And we just continue just to trust in that. And we know that all things will be worked out for your good. Continue just to hold on to us, Father, as we wonder and we stray sometimes. Just sin and just know that you have everything well in hand. We thank you. We ask for continued blessings on all families. We ask for your mercy and we ask for good days, Father, because we know that good days are coming. And Father, we ask this humbly to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Deacon. Well, friends, we, uh, we come to the point now of our message for today and ask you if you'll join your hearts with mine as we unpack this word that has been presented for us in the Gospel of John. It's part of a series that we've been doing on I Am. We have been looking at the I Am's of Jesus and how he continues to define himself. And so today's message comes from John 15, verses 1 through 3. 
And I don't know, for some reason, I didn't bring a Bible. Wait a minute. Yeah, that's part of doing this all new. All right. John 15. First three verses. Jesus says, I am the vine, and my father is the vine, vine grower. He removes every branch in me that bears no fruit. Every branch that bears fruit, he prunes to make it bear more fruit. You've already been cleansed by the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me as I abide in you. Just as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I'm the vine. You are the branches. Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. But apart from me, you can do nothing. Father God, we pray that these words would have a resting place in our hearts and that we might find consolation and hope from the words that you have proclaimed to us and knowledge of who you are. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my friends, we're living in unprecedented times. This virus is sweeping the earth, is causing changes to the ways in which we work, the ways in which we play, the ways in which we educate, even the ways how we worship together. The byword for everything seems to be social isolation. But remaining safe distances from each other does not mean we have to be isolated. This Isolation that we talk about is physical, but we need to remain socially connected to one another. And so in this series that we've been doing, I Am, all coming from the Gospel of Count of John, we hear Jesus' description of himself. While feeding the 10,000, he proclaimed he was the bread of life in John 6, 36. While he was with the Pharisees and other religious leaders, he described himself as the door. And a few verses later in 10 and 11, in the same gospel, he confirms that he is the good shepherd, the good shepherd willing to lay down his life for his sheep. So we're going to jump ahead in the sequence to this proclamation in John 15 that he is the vine. We'll return to the other I am's in the following weeks. But consider the text today in the context of stay, spray, and pray. We're probably all familiar with the story of Howard Hughes. He was a big time businessman. He dabbled in oil and entertainment in the aviation industry. And his uh, successes made him billions of dollars. And you would think that anybody with the kind of money that Howard Hughes had would be living a life of ease and tranquility. Just imagine him sitting by the pool every day, sipping little drinks with umbrellas out of him. Not so with Howard Hughes. The last 20 years or so of his life, Howard Hughes was the poster child for worry and anxiety. He was overwhelmed by an unsubstantiated fear that people were out to get him. He spent his last decades living in hotels where he would rent out old floors. Those closest to him say he was so overwhelmed by worry and fear that he would sit in a pitch black room for long periods of time. Hughes refused to allow anybody to come to see him. If you wanted to communicate with Howard Hughes, specific instructions were provided. You had to take several tissues, cover the doorknob with them, knock and open the door ever so slightly. Hughes required this process because he was exceptionally fearful of germs. His worry led to severe stomach problems, causing him to sit alone in the bathroom sometimes for hours at a time. On the rare occasions that Hughes would come out of the hotel, he gave specific instructions to the driver. He'd say only smooth roads were to be taken, and the driver was never to drive more than 35 miles an hour. And if by chance they had to cross a railroad track or some uneven part of the road, he would make the driver slow down to two miles an hour. He was so nervous about getting in a wreck. For a man who seemingly had it all, all worry and anxiety dominated his life. The overwhelming paradox of Hughes was that the more successful he got, the more money he got, the more worry and anxiety festered in his soul. Howard Hughes would feel very comfortable in our current world worrying about the coronavirus. The paradox Hughes faces is the same paradox we face. Things do not eliminate worry and anxiety. They heighten worry and anxiety. The biggest lies we can think begin with, if I could just get married, if I just had a car, 
if I could just send my kids to that good school. There's no lasting happiness in earthly treasures. Happiness only comes in Jesus. There's a few statistics on worry that I want you to consider. 40% of what we worry about never comes to pass. 30% of what we worry about happened in the past. And guess what? We can't change that. 10% of what we worry about relates to health. And what's most funny and sad is that researchers have proven that the more you worry about your health, the worse your health gets, not better. 8% of worry is legitimate. But you know what? Even then, your worrying isn't going to change it. Your worry won't make the loan go through. Your worry won't make you pregnant or unpregnant. Your worry will not get rid of cancer. Your worry will not pay the bills. Worry is useless. And certainly we should be careful, but nothing has ever been gained through worry. There's a final problem with worry that Jesus points out. Not only is worry me-centered and useless, it's worldly. Worry is symptomatic of how unbelievers act. In Matthew 6, 32, we see the words, for the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Jesus is saying that the lives of those who couldn't care less about him are dominated by earthly treasure, and therefore worry. When you worry about your job, when you worry about your health, when you worry about your money, your mortgage loans, your kids' schools, your cars, your clothes, this virus, we're acting like the world. To be dominated by worry is essentially to show that it is our ultimate hope, and not a loving, caring father, but in the things of the world. So then how can we overcome worry? How can we overcome worry in our lives? I think this particular scripture that Jesus proclaims to us helps us. Because first of all, stay. Stay connected to the true vine. Jesus, the gardener. Father, Jesus, the vine, and the father, the gardener. Stay connected to the word. And think about how the many ways God has provided for us in the past. Those who feed their hearts on the record of what God has done in the past don't have to worry about the future. Worry refuses to learn the lessons of life. We are still alive. Our heads are still above water. And you know, if somebody had told us that we would have to go through what we've actually gone through, we probably would have thought that it was impossible to be in the situation we're in. The lesson of life is that somehow we've been enabled to bear the unbearable, to do the undoable and pass the breaking point and not break. The lesson of life is that worry is unnecessary. But in this current environment, how do you not worry? How do you trust God to see you through hard times? Well, think of a time in your past when you didn't think you were gonna make it and God showed up. Use that story to see, help you through this present circumstance. Think of the time when you didn't know how things were going to get paid, and yet God stepped in and the bill got paid. Think of the times when you didn't think you'd live to see another day, and yet God touched your body and you're alive today. Think of the time when the stress was so great that you thought you'd lose your mind or lose your marriage, and God stepped in and you're here today. Worry can create spiritual amnesia, causing you to forget that God the same God who saw you through is going to carry you through this. But you've got to remember the stories of his faithfulness and reflect upon the testimony he's established in your past to see you through the present. Secondly, spray. Take time to disinfect the areas where the virus might hide and prepare to infest. Increased hand washing is a critical recommendation. Do it. Spray your hands constantly and be careful about the spray that comes from coughing and sneezing. Those are the major means of virus transmittal. But as believers in Christ, those connected to the vine, we must continue to spray loving kindness. We must continue to spray goodness. We must continue to spray mercy to our loved ones, to our families, to our neighbors, to everyone that we come into contact with. Call other people. Just to hear the voice of another is a great encouragement right now. Stay positive, avoid the negative, limit the amount of time that you're focusing on this, and don't forget to laugh, laugh a lot. Some of us are still using restaurants for meals. Consider spraying your money with a local restaurant as opposed to a chain. The people who run these local restaurants are our neighbors. Disinfect your mind. 
God instructs us in his word. <clears throat> the Holy Spirit is our teacher through our personal devotions, through sermons, through teaching and interaction in our small groups. The Holy Spirit will cleanse and strengthen our lives through the word of God. God renews our mind so that we no longer conform to the ways of the world, but pursue his kingdom. He teaches us to hate sin and desire righteousness in our lives. So when we have sin in our lives, we want to be restored in our relationship with God because he is faithful to forgive us. Thirdly, pray. In chapter 15, Jesus uses a common illustration to talk to his disciples about effective relationships between God and us, humanity. As it was then and as it is today, there's a lot of knowledge about God. But there's not really a whole lot of personal relationship with God that's talked about. And so the Lord begins to describe the union between himself and his church using the word picture of the vine. If you take a limb off a tree or a leaf off a plant, the leaf by itself will soon wither away and die. And that's what Jesus is saying in the same passage. In verse 5, he says, for without me, you can do nothing. Plainly stated, without him, we cannot, we will not survive. Jesus is the true vine, bringing life to the branches. The purpose of the vine is to bring nourishment to the branches in order that they might produce fruit. When separated from the vine, the branches wither and die. The vitality of our spiritual life is dependent upon our connection to Christ, who is the true vine. So each of us has to answer two questions this morning. First, are we connected to the vine? Is the life of Christ flowing within us? And secondly, if we are connected to the vine and we are joined to Christ, then how much fruit are we producing through our lives? Is there no fruit? Is there some fruit? Or is there an abundance of fruit? We can stay connected to the vine. We can stay connected to each other through prayer. God places us in relationship with other believers. We need each other to grow effectively and fruitful. None of us can make it alone, especially now. I believe this is the single most important thing that God does for us. <clears throat> Being a part of a church, sharing in a loving relationship with other Christians is vital to our spiritual health. But we, if we're not careful, our gathering, our singing, our praying and giving can become merely the impression of being church. The evidence of our fire is present in the numbers of transformed lives and living in a way that others can identify us as Christians. They will know us by our love our love of Christ, and our love of one another. And again, I'm only speaking with admiration for all the ways that folks at New Elam are stepping up to take care of each other, to take care of people in the community. It's a wonderful thing, and it identifies us as believers. God bless you. Thank you. But if we don't let God lift us up, <clears throat> we're in danger of becoming a fruitless branch that chooses not to remain in Christ. If we don't enter into relationship with other believers, if we don't apply his word to our lives, if we don't let the Holy Spirit renew our minds, then we're cutting off the flow of Christ's source of life that he places within us. And I want to ask you to look at verse 6 for just a minute. Don't miss this warning because there is a warning here. It says those were branches that were once in Christ, but they didn't remain in him. These branches once had the source of life flowing within them. They had produced fruit in the past, but they're no longer producing fruit. They're cutting themselves off from the source of life, believing they can find life in other vines. The deceitfulness of sin has ensnared them. And if we turn away from Christ and don't remain in him, then we become a withered, fruitless branch that will ultimately be thrown into the fire. Not all branches are as fruitful as others. Some branches may have bushels of fruit, while another branch may only have a single bushel or a peck or two. But still, other branches were going to be barren because they have no fruit at all. So don't confuse quantity and quality. As a believer, you are joined to the vine. The life of Christ within the vine is what produces the fruit. Therefore, any fruit produced in your life, be it obedience, production, the fruit of the Spirit, it's all good fruit. Christ's life in you will not produce inferior fruit. Christ, the true vine, only produces the best quality fruit. However, each of us branches can restrict the quantity of fruit produced in our lives. You see, fruit is a visible evidence of what's inside. For the Christian, the one who claims Christ as Lord of their life, the fruit is evident in the way we live. In the, 
that our life is Christ-centered, that we're loving others, that our, we are relationship-oriented. We don't want to be like the guy who was bit by the dog that had rabies. He was informed that he would have to go through a series of 16 painful shots before he was healed, and he asked the doctor for a piece of pen and a paper. The doctor asked him why he needed that. He said, I need to make a list of everybody I want to bite before I get cured. No, instead, maybe we should think of the names of the person we've wronged and call them and say we're sorry. Perhaps we should forgive the one who's wronged us. Maybe it's time to stop judging the sin of other people that we consider so much worse than our sin. Stop trying to blow out the candle of others so that yours is going to grow brighter. The fruit should reflect the life transformed by the power of Christ. Let our lives reflect the power, passion, and purpose of a life that's dedicated to God. And so that brings us back to the question of quantity. How much fruit is your life producing? Is there no fruit? Is there some fruit? Or is there an abundance of fruit? And finally, when we mature as believers, that we bear an abundance of fruit, the Father is glorified and we show ourselves to be Christ's disciples. Abide in me and I in you, he says in verse 4. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Put God first in your life. Make certain that what you do is rooted in relationship rather than rules. Too frequently people will confuse structure for surrender. They cross off a list and think they put God first, when in actuality if God is first, you don't need a list because you will naturally seek him. He will naturally guide you. His heart, his way become your way because of your personal surrender out of love. Whatever religious activity triumphs relationships, the victory of Christ is no longer experienced in a believer's life. One of the greatest dangers in our church today is for religion to replace an intimate relationship with our Savior. And by religion, I mean this external adherence to to exercises, to codes, to practices in the name of God, but don't really have anything to do with God. For example, if you go to church because it's a religious or spiritual thing to do, rather than because you are motivated to spend time in worship, worshiping God, learning about him, experiencing him, then you're practicing religion. Religion is anything you do for God that does not come out of a heart connected to God. And it's not that there aren't a lot of people doing a lot of things, excellent things in the name of religion. A lot of these same people attend church, help the hurting, or say all the correct spiritual things. It's just that they've missed the priority of the kingdom. They've missed a relational connection that comes through voluntary surrender to God's will. They have not made God first in their hearts, and then they wonder why they aren't experiencing any victory, any power, any hope, any authority, and fear has overtaken their lives. External observances, rules of religion can actually get in the way of a relationship. Jesus, the true vine, is producing fruit in his branches. It's good fruit, and it alone will endure. And so again, I ask you two questions. Are you connected to the vine? Is the life of Christ flowing within us? And secondly, if we are connected to the vine and we are joined to Christ, then how much fruit are we producing through our lives? No fruit, some fruit, a lot of fruit. The real evidence of our connectedness to God is how we stay, spray, and pray. And finally, I want to say, and how we pay. If I had said pay at the beginning, y'all might have cut it off. But as a faithful member of a congregation, we have a responsibility to support the mission of our church and the kingdom of God. You may have noticed with a lot less running around, a lot less haircuts, a lot less extra spending, we have a little extra money. And last week, when I used the electronic giving opportunity on our website, I had the choice to give to the building operations fund or the general fund. And when I realized that I had a little extra money, I did both. And I pray you'll consider doing the same as you look at your bank account and realize there's some extra money there. Maybe this is a time to do more. We also need to pay attention to those around us. I'm overwhelmed with joy at your expressions of benevolence to our elders, those who need extra attention. Keep it up. You need to be aware and diligent in our responsibilities to care for each other. And I may have told you this story before, but I'm going to say it again. Years before modern railway crossings were equipped with electronic gates, you see a shack at a major railroad crossing. And inside the shack, there'd be a guard. 
And when the train was coming, the guard would gather his lantern, stand at the intersection and alert traffic that the train was coming. Well, it turns out that at this one intersection, the guard fell asleep. He heard the train coming, he woke up in a fright, he ran through the intersection and began frantically waving his lantern. But unfortunately, he got there too late. There was an accident and lives were lost. There was a lawsuit and he was asked if he was present at the intersection, he said yes. He was asked if he waved his lantern, he said yes. He was exonerated and years later, someone found him crying and asked him, why are you crying? And he went on to recount his testimony. He said, yes, I was at the intersection. Yes, they asked me if the lantern was waved, but nobody ever asked me if the lantern was lit. Let's keep our lanterns lit and pay attention. Surveys tell us that the morals of our society are falling. The church in America is declining and their forces approaching the intersection, and it looks like tragedy is about to run us over. And I'll tell you, brothers and sisters, it is not the responsibility of the government. It's not the responsibility of the schools. It is not the responsibility of the police to save God's people from this looming tragedy, the moral decay of our society. The church has been divinely ordained to offer salvation to the world. We've been given a light originating in the fire of Pentecost. And my hope is that we will, in the words of the old hymn, let our little lights shine. Choice is yours. You can either stay the way you are, you can choose to be grafted into the life-giving vine of Jesus Christ. But I assure you all the other vines are useless and lifeless. The branches have no real fruit because there's no real life in the vine. But when you're connected to Jesus, suddenly everything is going to be made new and alive. Stay, spray, pray, and pay. I pray the Holy Spirit continues to work in you, to change you, to fan into flame the fire that is in each one of you, that we might become contagious Christians. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the gifting to the people in our congregation who have volunteered themselves and their talents to help us to stay connected to one another and to stay connected to you, the vine. And so, Lord, we thank you for this day. We ask your blessing, your continued blessing upon us. You have at this day, at this season of Passover, when there was a time that the blood of the lamb was put on the, on the post and the death angel passed over, how um, wonderful it is that we have been passed over from all this virus, from all this sickness. Continue to bless us. Continue to keep us strong. Continue to keep us faithful. Continue to keep us connected to one another, and to you in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we go forward, thank you again. I, I, didn't, want to, I wanted, didn't want to be remiss in thanking you for many birthday greetings and, and gestures. I really appreciate it. It's been good. Uh, it's been a lot going on. But again, we're very grateful to the folks who are stepping up in big ways to help us continue to be the example of light in a dark community, in a dark place. So bless you all. Go now in blessings and favor of Jesus Christ. May God continue to shelter you and keep you from hurt, harm, and danger and fear. We have no reason to fear because God is near. Bless us all, Lord, as we gather in your name and go forward in your name. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Thank you all. We'll have a uh, weekly conference call on Thursday at six o'clock. And you're welcome to come and we can update everybody on where we are. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Thank you, Sister Briscoe. You're welcome, Pastor. Don't forget to remind them to drive through again. Yeah, I think it's gone. Oh, okay. Some people are still on, I think. Okay, well, again, we're meeting at 11. We'll be up at the church at 11. If you want to come by with your donations of food, your tithes and offerings, or any other supplies that we might take to Cumberland High. Thank you. See you at 11 at church. Stay safe.